Okay, last month of the semester. So for the next two weeks, we will talk about um, uh, network security. So we're talking about network security at different layers. And today we begin with what is computer network, what is internet, and uh, uh, what are their architectures. So basically, as long as you have two computers, you collect them together. Uh, we call them a computer network, of course. Uh, there are billions of devices right now collected to the internet. Uh, so they are all connected uh, somehow. And for all computer networks, uh, smaller ones, isolated ones, or bigger ones, uh, like our computer, there are network hardware, and there are also network uh, software. So uh, the internet is not only a network of computers. It's also a network of networks. So some of them are... Uh, subnets, and uh, um, the internet, of course, it is uh, also a single uh, huge network to transport data, messages uh, from anywhere to anywhere. Uh, a little bit history about internet. Uh, it started at DAPA back in the 60s, and then uh, in the 70s, there were uh, five nodes in the internet um, or in the west coast. Then several milestones uh, in the development of the internet. Uh, 74, 1974, um, the first version of uh, TCP specifications uh, were out. And also, um, actually last week or last month, the new Turing Award of this year was given to the professor who developed the uh, Ethernet. I, I forgot where he is from right now. So Ethernet is obviously an important part of uh, making internet possible. It's not really part of the TCP IP. It's lower than that, but it's also a very important part for our network. So in 1984, um, so uh, the internet with 100, 1,000 hosts, uh, they started using uh, TCP IP. Uh, some numbers about the internet uh, growth trend. So back in 77, only 100 hosts on internet. Um, in 2020, probably 40 billion devices are internet right now. And the number will just keep going up. There will be trillions of um, devices, uh, hosts collected to internet in 2034, 30, 35, I believe. Um, so this is a figure, old figure, you can say the number of devices that click to internet. And the number just increased exponentially. And uh, uh, it's still the same trend right now. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of low-end devices clicked into internet. We call them Internet of Things. So for any computer network, there are uh, three, three major parts. Uh, the the hardware-wise, three major things. Uh, the first is the network hosts, the end devices. Uh, then there are uh, communication mediums, and also, uh, very importantly, the networking devices, the devices that help the hosts to connect to each other uh, using the communication mediums. So you are all very familiar with the hosts, um, your smartphones, uh, drones, uh, VR, AR devices, uh, a lot of devices you are using, uh, they are network. As long as they are connected to the internet, they are a host there. And also there are servers. Uh, you do not see them every day, uh, but your computer talk to those servers could be web servers. They are also network hosts. Uh, then there are all kinds of uh, communication media, uh, wired ones, uh, cables, uh, wireless ones, uh, like uh, infrared. There are just all kinds of media there as well. Um, but for network security, uh, we mainly talk about the networking devices. Uh, those are hubs, switches, routers. So we will talk about why, how they are different and uh, the security issues uh, with them. Um, then the, besides hardware, obviously we also have software for computer networks. Uh, first, we have 
the network protocols. So those are the uh, languages, different hosts they speak, so they can communicate uh, with each other. And the software to understand those languages, uh, usually they are implemented as um, uh, drivers, as uh, network adapter drivers, part of the kernel, the TCP IP uh, protocol stack also implemented uh, in the kernel. Then there are socket functions. So Berkeley basically abstract a concept of socket uh, for applications to use. Then there are user space libraries for applications to use. Um, then for those networking devices, there are also different software. Um, uh, Cisco, one of the biggest player in networking, uh, they have a lot of softwares running on their routers and switches. And also in the last 10 years, one of the major development in uh, network or networking is um, something called a software defined networking, uh, SDN. Uh, many of you probably heard about that before. So um, that will make your switches programmable. So I guess most of you probably already heard about this, the open systems intercollection model of our uh, network. So this was introduced back in 1984, and uh, it outlines what needs to be done to send data from one computer to another. It doesn't specify how this should be done. And uh, in this model, it's basically a theoretical uh, blueprint that help us understand how data gets from one computer to another, uh, help us develop standards. Um, also, um, it divides the, our computer network into seven layers. From to bottom to to the to up, we have the physical layer, data link layer, uh, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. So this is defined in the OSI model: seven layers. Uh, our what we are really using, especially as a TCP IP model, is um, a simplified version of this. Uh, however, uh, this model is um, what guide us to, to reach where we are at right now. So uh, the physical layer basically defines the physical properties of different communication media, uh, the data link layer, is a logical organization of data bits uh, transmitted on a particular medium. So because of that, the physical layer and the data link layer, they are closely related to each other. And in the TCP model, usually uh, we just uh, put them together as a one, one layer. Then the network layer defines the addressing and the routing structure of the network. A transport layer defines uh, how uh, retransmission or transmission will be used to ensure data delivery end to end. Uh, session layer describes how request and replay packets. Uh, presentation layer uh, specifies the syntax of data being transferred. Application layer is where a user or programs uh, run, and um, they can send all kinds of data you want. They want so. If we use the uh, post office or postal uh, aller, uh, analogy, so what we can um, use this example. So let's say if you if you write a twenty page letter and you want to physically twenty page letter and you want to uh, send that to a friend in another country, what you do is the application there you write the letter, so that's the application there, then the trans the presentation layer can translate the letter so the recipient can understand the application layer data. The session layer ensures that the intended recipient can receive the letter, and the transportation letter will separate and number those pages. We have 20 pages there, right? Then we will send each of those pages uh, separately. Then the network layer is kind of like the postal, postal center. we sort sorted the letters. So we have basically 20 letters in this case by the zip code and route them to the closest uh, postal center of, of the destination. Then 
the data link layer is kind of the local post office determining uh, which vehicles to deliver those letters. And the physical layer is kind of like the trucks, the planes, uh, the cars, um, the uh, rail that that really uh, cap carry the letters between those stations. So a little bit about the TCP IP suite. Um, so uh, I this was um, so th this is actually the dominating protocol we are using right now. Um, or we can say this is a winning protocol uh, in the last several decades. Uh, there were many different competing protocols, but this uh, suite um, actually won the game. That's why we are using this. Uh, other companies, they have been developing other protocols uh, in the last 50 years. Uh, one of them I want to mention is called uh, IPX, uh, SPX. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is uh, I actually used this before. So all other protocols, I never I never have a chance to say them. Uh, but the IPX, SPS, I actually use them. So when I play, when I was in high school, I play Red Alert 2. And uh, how many of you still play this? No one played this before? Yes. So Red Alert 2, uh, before that, obviously, there was Red Alert. And so this was a very popular computer game. And the Red Alert 2, actually, they do not only support uh, TCP IP. They also support the, the protocol IPX, SPX. So if you play with your friends um, just in a local network, you don't have to use I TCP IP to do that. You can use uh, IPX, SPX to play with each other. So uh, we actually use this to play when we, when we were in high school and also back in college. So uh, right now, um, the network protocol um, kind of look like this. So in the middle, the network layer, uh, we only have the IP protocols. So that is the protocol uh, winning everything. All right. The transport layer, we mainly only have TCP or UDP protocols. Uh, the network layers, uh, the data link layer or physical layer, we have all kinds of protocols. You can use, uh, you can use uh, optical fiber. Uh, you can use uh, wireless CDMA. Um, you can also use Ethernet. Uh, however, if you go up to the network layer, uh, we are all using uh, IP. Uh, V4 or V6. Uh, then the transport layer, we only have TCP and UDP. Then app at the application layer, then we have all kinds of protocols. Uh, every application. They may have their own protocol. Then there are some well-defined application layer protocols in the TCP IP suite. Uh, so if we look at all the protocols we are using right now, it's, it's kind of like this uh, hourglass architecture. A very small thing in the, in the middle, uh, narrow in the middle, only three protocols. Uh, however, the upper layers and lower layers, we have all kinds of customized protocols. So the TCP IP uh, protocol suite, uh, they do not really define of official layer structure. Um, but the protocols, they imply there are five or four uh, structures, uh, layers. Uh, the first one uh, from the bottom to up, the first one is the physical layer or data link layer. The data link layer is also called the network access layer. Uh, after that, we have the internet layer, basically IP. Uh, then a uh, transport layer, uh, basically TCP and the UDP. Then application layer, all kinds of protocols. So um, in the next uh, two, three weeks, we will talk about uh, attack and defenses at different layers. We will look at each layer first, how it works. Then we look at some defense, some attacks and defense there. Um, and you will see that we will use a lot of uh, background knowledge we learned before, the crypto tools. We're basically using crypto tools to secure those protocols. So this is a, a mapping between the I, uh, OSI model to the, TP, the TCP IP model. 
Um, so the application presentation and session in the OSI model maps to the application layer. Uh, transport layer is the same in both models. Uh, network layer also the same. Then the data link layer and the physical layer are mapped to the data link layer. Uh, also, you can say uh, some of the books. Uh, this is a classic book, uh, Computer Networks by Andrew Tannenbaum. Uh, so he's a professor in uh, Netherlands. Uh, I believe he is, uh, he's a US citizen, but he has been in Netherlands for decades. So he is, um, he, he is also the inventor of uh, Minix, which is a, a operating system, a micro, micro core, micro kernel operating system, uh, which influenced the design of uh, Linux as well. Uh, so uh, he, he wrote uh, several classic books, including this one, Computer Networks, and also maybe several books on operating systems. So in his book, uh, he actually used uh, uh, five layers to, to teach the network computer network course. So um, the data we send at different layers, uh, usually we give it uh, a different uh, name, uh, but we all call them protocol uh, data unit. That's the smallest unit uh, of a protocol at different uh, layers. Uh, for example, an application layer, we simply call the smallest unit uh, data. And uh, at a transport layer, uh, especially for TCP, uh, we call it segment. Uh, uh, internet layer, uh, it's called a packet or a diagram. Uh, data link layer, uh, we call it a frame. And the physical layer is just a bit. So user data is passed or application level data is passed from uh, layer to layer. Uh, outgoing data is packaged and identified for delivery to the layer under lease. So it will go from application layer to physical layer, uh, then reach the recipient, then the recipient will decipher the data from physical layer to the application layer. At each layer, the control information is either added, removed, or changed um, from user data or to user data each, each layer. And uh, those control information usually will be part of the header. It will be at the beginning of the data. Uh, some of the protocols will also add metadata uh, at the end uh, as a trigger. So uh, for example, uh, you use a browser on your laptop to download a file from a website. Since you are using a browser to download this, the application level, you're actually using uh, uh, HTTP protocol, right? So what the website does is the website will retrieve the file from its own database or whatever. Uh, then the website will add a HTTP header at the front of the data. Then the website will call the TCP IP stack API of the server on the server, uh, which will and a TCP header um, to the to the HTTP header and also the data. So by doing this, you can say the data goes from higher layers to lower layers, and uh, there are more headers added in front of the actual data. So after the TCP layer, we go to the um, IP layer, the so IP header is added. Uh, then the website, the physical server, may be connected to the network using Ethernet. Um, then an Ethernet header is created, is added uh, in the front. And also uh, Ethernet uh, packets, uh, frames, they also have a trigger. That's why the front and end, uh, we were both and some metadata there. Then the, the same, this frame will be sent out uh, on the physical network, just as bits. Then eventually, after many middle boxes, after many middle boxes in the network, uh, that those bits, they have, maybe they have been changed. Uh, the headers has been changed. Eventually, they reach your laptop. So your laptop, what it says at the beginning is just the bits. 
your laptop is not physically, it's not wired connected, let's assume that. It just use Wi-Fi to connect to, to your local network, to your local router. Then, then that frame will not have the Ethernet header. Instead, it will have a Wi-Fi header. So you can see that this header has been changed from the, um, this, this is not what originally sent by the website because you don't have the original Ethernet header. Instead, you have a Wi-Fi header. Uh, then the, the Wi-Fi adapter uh, pick it up and uh, it analyzes this header. It figure out, oh, this is an IP packet. Then it will give to the kernel of your laptop and your kernel says, oh, this is an IP header. Try to check a field in the IP header which says this is actually a TCP, which this is a TCP uh, segment. Uh, then the TCP segment, there is a port number. And that port number is associated with your application. In this case, that's your browser, right? Uh, then the kernel knows I need to give this TCP message, the TCP uh, segment, to the browser. So the browser will say the uh, TC, uh, HTTP header, and the browser say, oh, this is exactly the message I'm, um, I'm expecting. Uh, eventually, uh, you will get the data. So first of all, the, uh, the data could have been segmented m many, many times. Uh, it doesn't arrive as a whole package. It may be divided into many smaller packages and eventually arrive at your browser. And your browser may need to assemble them together uh, and uh, get, give you, the user, the uh, whole file. So many different layers, uh, they can segment or divide the packets at their layer. Uh, for example, the TCP layer, the transport layer uh, may segment uh, upper layer um, data. So the application, uh, the application data could be very big, like a file. And the TCP layer maybe uh, divide them into smaller chunks. And for each chunk, we'll add another uh, TCP header. Then give this to the IP layer. Um, or other, other layers may also do the same thing. Uh, for example, um, uh, the older version of IP packets can only be 64 uh, kilobytes. Uh, this this is the size for IPv4. I, I don't know if IPv6 might be bigger. Uh, also, if you're going down to the, if you go down to the data link layer, uh, the Ethernet can only send uh, 1,500 bytes, and some of them will be actually be their own metadata, the headers. So the actual payload will be even smaller than that. So next, let's take a look at how uh, hub and uh, switch works. Um, next class, we will talk about upper layers, uh, the IP and TCP. And today, we will look at the first attack at the data link layer, uh, for our, uh, especially for our Ethernet. So at data link layer, um, this is basically where we have the protocols that transfer uh, data between uh, adjacent network nodes in a, a wide area network or a local area network. Um, so, so the data link frames, we call them frames, they do not across the boundary of a local network. Um, the data link protocols, uh, they focus on local delivery and uh, addressing here. Uh, let's say uh, we have, uh, the, in the previous example, the, you download a file from a website example. Uh, the website send you a frame uh, at the website's local network. That frame has an Ethernet header, but it's its own network. That Ethernet network port of that website server is connected to its own uh, switch and eventually a router, right? But that router will eventually replace that Ethernet header to other Ethernet headers, so it can go to other routers. So when the package eventually receive 
by your laptop. Uh, it doesn't have the old Ethernet header anymore. Uh, it have a, another local data link header, which is a, a, a Wi-Fi header. So uh, many other things can also be changed during the during the process. But uh, the fire data uh, is supposed to be uh, intact there. Uh, so it's kind of like if you want to travel to uh, San Francisco, let's say you want to visit San Francisco, uh, then you maybe you take a taxi from home to the uh, Buffalo Airport. And uh, from home to Buffalo Airport, that is a local transportation, and that is a data link layer. Then you fly from Buffalo to San Francisco, uh, so that is uh, intercity transportation that's uh, uh, in the internet. That could be a lot of um, middle boxes to help you to do that. Then uh, when you get to San Francisco, you take another shuttle bus, uh, which is another local transportation from airport to hotel. And that is also kind of like the data link layer. And data link layer, like I said, there are many different protocols. Uh, they are usually associated with uh, the hardware we are using. Uh, the TCP IP suite, uh, they do not really include the data link layer uh, because the goal of TCP IP is to connect the world, connect the whole internet. It's not about the local protocols. It's about the uh, internet working protocols. So um, that's why they are not defined uh, in the internet uh, suite. Well, there is a pro There are several protocols related to the lower layers, but uh, uh, they do not really work on the lower layer. For example, one of the protocol we are talking about, Shuen, uh, ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Uh, ARP obviously work across the boundary of um, data link layer and the network layer. Uh, some example data link protocols. Um, a P2P protocol. Uh, this is a protocol used for um, dial-up internet access. So back in the 90s, maybe early 2000, people still use that. Uh, you use your telephone line to connect to internet. And um, so uh, the protocol is called PPP. Uh, so, so, so for PPP frames, you don't have a Wi-Fi header. You don't have a you don't have a uh, Ethernet header because, first of all, you're not you're not using Ethernet cables. You are using the phone cables, right? Um, then after the header, you will have um, also IP diagrams, so you can talk to any other IP services uh, in the world. However, your your local collection is not doesn't have to be Ethernet. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Ethernet. Uh, this is obviously a protocol we are still using. Uh, if you're Computer is physically connected to wired, use a wired connection, where most likely we're still using an Ethernet connection. Then those Ethernet frames will have an Ethernet header, then the IP diagram, then Ethernet trigger. Uh, for Wi Fi networks, so everyone in the room right now, you have multiple devices using Wi Fi network. So the Wi Fi frame will look like a Wi Fi header, then the IP diagram, then the uh, Wi Fi triggers. So at the data link layer, uh, we also have address for each device. And uh, that is called the MAC address, the media access control address. Um, so for Ethernet, the MAC address is a unique value associated with your Ethernet adapter. Uh, so for Wi-Fi network, we're using the same uh, MAC address. Uh, for, for PPP, probably the same. I'm not. I'm not uh, sure about the PPP because it has been it has been at least 20, 20 years since I used the PPP. Um, so the MAC address is also known as the hardware address or uh, physical address. Um, the MAC address has uh, 48 bits. Uh, usually we write it this way. Okay, uh, that's uh, so one one letter here represents because we are going to use hex to do this, right? So one letter present uh, four bits. So um, two letters, eight bits. And in total, 
48 bits. Um, so theoretically, uh, every network device in the world, uh, they should have a unique uh, MAC address. Um, the first half of the MAC address contains the ID number of the adapter manufacturer, like uh, Cisco or uh, other manufacturers. Um, then the second half is the device ID those manufacturers should assign those numbers. So technically, they should be unique. Um, but on some devices, you can also change your MAC address, right? Um, so like I said, uh, Ethernet Wi-Fi adapters, they have the same uh, MAC address. So for Ethernet frame, uh, we have uh, the data. So this is a data. This is a payload. Uh, usually, it's an IP diagram. Then this is an Ethernet header. In the Ethernet header, you can say there is a destination for each package frame. There is a destination MAC address and also a source MAC address, which tells another local device uh, we, where this uh, frame is from and where this frame is to. Um, Wi-Fi has similar structure. Uh, it has a source, it has a destination MAC address, a uh, source MAC address. Um, it also has a router MAC address and also uh, access point MAC address. So for Wi-Fi frame header, there are actually uh, four MAC addresses, not only the source and destination, but also those local network infrastructures. Uh, next, we will look at uh, what is an Ethernet hub and how it works. Um, so, how many of you used the hub before? Because this is a this is actually a very old device. Uh, not many people are still using hub. Uh, we still use switch, but we don't really use hub. We use switch, we use router, but uh, um, not not many networks are using hub. So, hub is a very simple network. Uh, or networking device to collect multiple Ethernet devices uh, together. Um, so maybe 20 years ago, if you want to form your own network at your home, uh, you will get a, some of that time, people still get a hub or switch. Uh, hub usually is much cheaper uh, because it's a working mechanism. Uh, it's very simple, uh, but it's very slow. So next, we can we can see why uh, it's slow. Let's say we have a small computer network, a local network. We have four computers, uh, each of them using Ethernet cable to connect to a hub. Uh, that hub also have four ports, four Ethernet ports connected to those four computers. So when computer A want, wants to send a message to computer B, uh, what it does is prepare that frame, then send it to hub, right? So the hub will only do one simple thing. The hub will broadcast uh, that frame to all other ports. The hub will not trying to understand the frame, not trying to analyze the frame. It will just broadcast. So it will broadcast to all other uh, computers. Uh, no matter whether that frame is for those computers. Let's say A wants to send a message to B, uh, C and D will also get the message, uh, even if they don't want that. They will get the message. So Hub is very easy to implement. Uh, it's very affordable, but the problem is it, it makes uh, collision happens um, very, very uh, frequently. So the throughput of the network will be um, will be very low. So collision here means uh, this is a physical connected network. When A is sending a message, uh, B and C, B, C, D, they cannot send message at the same time because this is only a one physical while, right? So uh, if you send a lot of unnecessary messages here, uh, let's say when A send a message to B, C cannot send a message to D because they share the same network. Um, however, those are, should be two isolated 
um, network connections. They should not interfere with each other. Uh, that's why then uh, I believe maybe Cisco introduced a, a switch. Uh, so switches, uh, they forward frames selectively. Uh, they forward frames uh, to the network segments that only need those messages. Uh, so uh, in switches, there are switch tables. So the switch tables, they map destination MAC address to an outgoing interface. The outgoing interface here means a physical port, a port number. Uh, then the switches, they can construct switch tables automatically. So let's say the same four computers and uh, we connect them with a switch. So um, if you go to any data center or um, any place right now, uh, we, we use a lot of switches. So let's say um, those four computers, the switches itself, uh, it has four ports, and they are physically connected to those four computers. Now A wants to send out a message to C in this case. When A send out a message to C, a will prepare an Ethernet frame. That frame will send to the switch. And that switch will not broadcast this to BCD. Instead, it will only send the message to C. So that's to do that, obviously, the switch has to analyze the, the header uh, of the, the data link header of the, um, the frame. So it knows that this one I need to, to send to the physical port number three. Okay. So modern switches, especially uh, with software defined uh, networking, SDN, uh, the switches are programmable. Uh, they are smarter than uh, old switches. They do not only look at the uh, frame headers. They can also look at the TCP headers, IP headers, or uh, even application layer headers. But the traditional switch we're talking about here uh, only look at those data link headers. So um, one protocol to help switches to do that and also help all devices on the a local network to talk with each other is called the address resolution protocol or ARP. So uh, this protocol works at the boundary of the data link layer and also the uh, IP layer. Uh, it's part of the TCP IP suite. So this protocol helps uh, translate the network layer address. So the network layer address here, since we're only using uh, one protocol at the network layer, which is IP, it means the IP address. It translates the IP address to data link layer address, uh, which means uh, MAC address. It translates IP address to MAC address. So this is a format of a ARP uh, packet. So um, this packet, when it's sent out to the network, if you are using an Ethernet, then there will be an Ethernet header in front of this. Uh, the, the package itself, it uh, defines the hardware type of the underlying network. In this case, let's say we want to use Ethernet. It also defines the upper layer protocol in this case, we are using IP, so um, those are the predefined numbers. Then there will be the hardware address lens, the protocol address lens. Then there are two operations. One is request, another one is reply. So the goal here is to translate the protocol address to the hardware address. Uh, then it has the sender's hardware address. Uh, uh, if it's Ethernet, six bytes. Uh, sender's protocol address, if it's IPv4, just four bytes. Then you have the target, hardware address, and hardware protocol address. So that is what the header looks like. Um, if we send this out to the Ethernet header, uh, this will be treated as an Ethernet payload. Then you will have the Ethernet header and also Ethernet uh, trigger. Uh, the Ethernet header has its own MAC address, source, ad source MAC address, and um, a type to specify what it is the payload, the payload type it is sending. Uh, the trigger here is actually just a CRC. Uh, let's look at a more concrete example to understand how ARP works and also uh, what security issues it has. 
Let's say the scenario here is we have a local network with four computers, um, uh, A, B, C, D, and they are just physically connected to the network. There's no cache of uh, each other's address whatsoever. Uh, uh, however, they already have an IP address, okay? Um, and somehow we already know others' IP address. This happens a lot, right? When you talk to Google, uh, you you basically you know Google's IP address. Of course, there's a lot of layer of abstraction. You know Google's URL, but the URL maps to many different IP addresses. Here we assume that we know the IP address, but we don't know the physical address. So computer A wants to talk to computer B. Uh, a only knows B's IP address. It doesn't know its lower layer address, the physical layer address. Eventually, the package has to be sent by those physical devices, and they need the physical address, which is a MAC address. They cannot just send you the IP address. So, uh, so first of all, uh, A has this uh, IP address, which is 192.168.1.1, uh, and with um, uh, 24 bits of the network uh, masking. Then A knows that B's address is 1.2, and uh, using the IP address rule, uh, A can calculate and decide that um, B is actually in my own network. Uh, B is not like 10.5.6. Let's say seven, right? If it's that, if you use a, a network mask, A can know that oh, that is not in my local network. Uh, in this case, uh, A will know that B is in my local network. Then uh, A will check if I already know B's physical address. Uh, in this case, uh, B A doesn't know B's physical address. So A will construct an ARP request. Uh, basically, the ARP request is asking everyone in the network uh, what is the physical address, the MAC address, for the IP 1.2. So this uh, ARP request, the header, the basically, the, it doesn't have any other payload. Um, it's the... the the data the, will look like this. The hardware layer, we have the Ethernet. The protocol layer, we have IP. Uh, hardware lens, uh, six bytes. Uh, protocol size, protocol lens, four bytes for IPv4. Then this is a ARP request. So request will be one. Then the sender's hardware address. The sender's own MAC address. In this case, the MAC address will be A. Uh, then the, A will put its own MAC address here. It will also put its own IP address here, which is 1.1. Uh, then the targeted hardware address, that's what A is asking. A doesn't know that. So simply put zero there. Then the targeted uh, protocol address, which is 1.2. So this message is very clear. A is asking what is the MAC address of uh, uh, B, uh, or the MAC address of 1.2, which I don't know. Uh, without that, obviously, since A do not have the MAC address of B, A cannot directly send the message to B because to send the message, the A need to prepare an Ethernet header which has a destination address which A doesn't know. That's why A is doing this. Then uh, A prepare this package. Um, then this package will go to the Ethernet uh, adapter of A. Uh, which will add the Ethernet headers to this package. So here we have the ARP package we just saw. Then the Ethernet uh, adapter will add uh, Ethernet headers, which also have a destination address and a source address. So the destination address we will just use OF or once, which means this is a broadcast message. I want to send this message to uh, all the Ethernet devices in the local network. And uh, the source address will be A's source address, like this. So after that, A will send this message to the switch, because the switch, only the switch is connected to A. Uh, after a switch gets this message, uh, the switch will say uh, the destination is broadcast. Uh, the source is A. So the switch will know that uh, I will, I shoot, 
send this message to all my physical ports, which means it will send to BCD and also router. At this point, the switch also doesn't know. Uh, let's we'll assume this is a, a new network. The switch also doesn't know A was connected to uh, its port, right? Now, because the switch gets this message, the switch knows uh, the computer A with this MAC address is connected to my physical port, this port. The switch also learned that. Then the switch will simply uh, forward all those messages to all its port. Then uh, BCD and also even a router connected to the switch uh, eventually uh, get this uh, package or frame. Then all those hosts or routers will try to pass the frame. Uh, by passing that, they they were use their own um, software, TCP, IP stack, and also uh, hardware. Then, let's say, um, host BCD, uh, they were, they see this message, they're saying uh, A is asking the MAC address of 1.2. Then it will compare its own IP address with 1.2. Uh, obviously, in this model, we assume all the devices, they are on list, they are cooperative here. Uh, they compare that, uh, and uh, then the router, the device C, the device D, they simply ignore this message uh, because they are not, they do not have the IP address 1.2, or and also maybe they do not know who have that uh, IP address 1.2. Uh, however, host B, uh, it says, okay, this message is actually asking for my MAC address. So it will prepare an ARP reply. And the ARP reply message will look like this. Uh, the operation here will be two, which is reply. Then it has the sender's hardware address, which is B's hardware address, uh, B in this case. The sender's protocol address, uh, 1.2, the target, uh, IP address, uh, MAC address A, and the target is IP address uh, 1.1. Then B will send this message to uh, switch. Uh, we, and in this case, B already know uh, who he wants to send to. He wants to send to A, right? The MAC address end with A, and it has own uh, MAC address end with B. Then B will send this frame to switch, and a switch which keeps a switch table will say the MAC address A connected to my physical port zero or physical port one. So the switch will not send this, doesn't have to send this package to C and D anymore. It can directly send this package only to A. Then after that, when A get this message, A will learn that uh, the IP address 1.2 is associated with address, the MAC address B then they can send the package uh, directly. So um, modern uh, operating systems, uh, devices, uh, they were, uh, obviously you do not send a ARP request every time you send a message. You simply remember the ARP mapping and that is called the ARP cache. Uh, so, uh, I, I think they, this is probably an example on uh, Linux. Uh, in this example, you can say um, on the the MAC address of this is on is associated with this IP address. This MAC address is associated with this IP address. So the, the software and hardware will basically uh, remember that information. So not every time you send a message, you need to uh, redo the ARP uh, request. The problem here, since we are we're not really interested in only the network side, but more into the security side. So the problem here is we assume all devices in the local network they are on list. Uh, they give you um, the real information. Uh, and uh, 
because of that, uh, so the ARP spoofing would be uh, very easy to um, to perform for for attackers. Uh, of course, this only works for local network. Uh, that's why there are limitations of this. But the idea here is to spoof. Um, so the attacker can construct a spoofed uh, ARP reply. So a target computer could be convinced to send frames uh, uh, which was originally for B instead of go to computer C. And the computer uh, B, the victim, uh, have no idea that redirection uh, took place. Um, let's see how this works. Uh, this, this is actually very simple. Uh, same as before, uh, A want to talk with B and uh, A doesn't know B's I, uh, MAC address, only know B's MAC address. Then uh, host C, another computer in the local network, is the attacker. Uh, when A send the ARP message broadcast to everyone through the switch, uh, C will send out a message to A, which is an ARP reply, saying that uh, I have the MAC address C, and my IP, IP address is um, 1.2. Obviously, he, his real IP address was 1.3, but uh, he will spoof this. Uh, then, because there is no authentication, there is no integrity check, uh, uh, it's a, there's a good chance that A and also the switch uh, will believe that's true. Uh, then later, when A send out messages to B, A will actually uh, send the message to C instead. So this problem is more uh, serious that uh, in ARP, you do not have to send out an ARP reply when there is an ARP request. Even if there is no ARP request, you can actively send out ARP reply just to tell people, hey, this IP address is associated with this MAC address. Okay. Um, uh, because of this, uh, what can happen is the attacker can uh, spoof the messages that it was the attacker should not have access to. Uh, the attacker can also do a DOS attack uh, to, um, for example, the the host B in this case is a web server. Uh, a wants to request a message from the web server, and the C can pretend I'm the web server. Then basically it's a DOS attack to the web server at B. Uh, also, a more advanced attack, uh, C can spoof both host A and B at the same time and trying to be the uh, man in the middle. The limitation of this attack is because this attack works at the data link layer, it only works for a local network. Uh, the attacker uh, must reside in the same local network uh, as the victim. Uh, the root problem of this attack, uh, like many other protocols we had before, is there is uh, no method in the original protocol uh, that a host can authenticate the peers, can authenticate the messages. This same attack works at other layers as well. Um, uh, let's say, what what is the next network mapping upper layers? What was what what is uh, network mapping network address mapping uh, mechanisms you can think of? Let's say the application layer and the uh, um, IP layer. We actually talk about that before, right? The URL map to an IP address. The DNS, right? So the DNS, it works like there are many DNS servers. The DNS servers tells people, tells a computer, uh, this URL actually uh, maps to this IP address, right? Uh, the original DNS protocol is the same as the original ARP protocol. There is no protection. There is no authentication. There is no, um, there is no uh, uh, integrity check, basically. Then, and it's an application level protocol. Then um, 
someone in the network can broadcast to other people or set up their own DNS server and telling uh, the google.com actually points to a different IP address. So it can redirect all the web uh, to direct, redirect all the um, the web traffic to their own server, right? Or just redirect to a, a black hole somewhere, right? So uh, there are many incidents uh, in the last ten years that large scale attacks uh, against those uh, DNS records. Uh, that's why in the last uh, maybe ten years, uh, how to add authentication to the DNS record. Uh, was a hot area. Uh, there are new protocol proposed, the DNS sec, I believe, um, is to add the security to the DNS records. But you can see the problems, uh, even though they are at different layers, uh, the root cause of problems they are the same. And we all need to use crypto tools to solve those problems. So um, let's go back to the data link layer. Uh, so how can we uh, defense against uh, the ARP uh, spoofing? Uh, one way is we just use static ARP entries that never change. Uh, obviously, this is not a good approach. This will not make your network uh, plug plug and use. It's it's not a good approach. Um, then uh, other approaches is just to use uh, crypto based. Um, Approaches. Let's say this is a paper published in uh, AXAC, uh, which is a which is also a good conference in computer security. Uh, I would say it's like maybe one of the best in the tier two, uh, tier four. I, I say many times there are four conferences, uh, tier two there are many conferences. Uh, this is um, this is published in AXAC, a tier two conference. So this paper this paper discussed that how we can uh, secure ARP. Um, even though the problems to, to secure ARP or the root cause of ARP is the same as the problem of DNS, but you can imagine uh, the impact of those two attacks are quite different. Uh, ARP only works for your local network, so it's not that impactful. But DNS will influence everyone who is on the internet. Uh, that's why. Uh, the, the value of protecting ARP uh, probably is not that valuable. Sometimes the cost is too high, you don't have to protect. I mean, if you are in your uh, local network, only your devices are there, uh, what are the chances that your devices will be a, a attacker's device? But uh, to protect the similar problems, address the similar problem at DNS level would be, uh, would be very impactful. But going back to this, let's take a look how, um, how it works. Uh, the idea is very simple. So this protocol is called uh, S uh, ARP uh, SAP. It basically provides message authentication to those ARP messages. Uh, it uses uh, asymmetric crypto, public key, private key. We learned before. So any uh, S ARP enabled host is identified by its own uh, IP address and also uh, a public key and private key uh, pair. A simple uh, cert certificate provides the binding uh, between the IP and the public key. That's it. That's a very simple idea. The idea we use uh, many other places. Uh, when you log in GitHub, when you can push GitHub, uh, you don't, uh, you, if you use the SSH to push code to uh, GitHub, you don't need to type the password. Uh, the reason you don't type password is because your identity, um, in this case, your identity is basically your email address, your GitHub account. That identity is um, is bind, uh, there is a binding between that identity and your public key. And the public key, you're logging, you're logging a GitHub website, you paste your public key on the website. So the website knows, okay, this public key belongs to this user. So when you push the code, um, uh, you don't need to type the password because uh, they will use the private key, public key to uh, to do the communication there. Uh, same idea here. It's just uh, we create a binding uh, between the IP address and the public key. 
uh, if the a host wants to connect to a local network, uh, they have to generate their public key and private key and send its certificate, which is an IP address and a public key binding to a third party, which is a um, trusted party in this case. Uh, we call it the authoritative key distributor, uh, AKD in this case. Then the correctness of the certificate is verified by the network manager uh, um, at the beginning, and the uh, host public key together with its IP address is entered in a repo. So this is kind of the CA, the certificate authority uh, in the PKI system. So um, in this case, uh, let's say, so each host uh, sends its signed certificate uh, containing its public key and IP address to the third party, uh, which will insert the public key and the IP address in a, its own local database uh, after the manager verifies that. Uh, let's say in that database, we will have uh, the ABCD three computers in this case. Uh, A will have its public key uh, bind it with the IP address 1.1, uh, say B bind it to 1.2. So if C wants to bind its own IP address, no, B's IP address 1.2 to its own public key, this will be identified offline by the network manager and they will uh, not allow this. They will not sign the certificate, basically. So in this protocol, uh, all reply messages, uh, the ARP reply messages, they are digitally, digitally signed by the sender uh, with the corresponding private key. So when host A asks, what is the MAC address of 1.2? Then B will reply, uh, 1.2 1. has a MAC address B, and it will sign by B's uh, private key. Uh, C cannot do this because um, say, let's say, so when, when, uh, when host A um, get this message B, then host A will retrieve the public key of 1.2, uh, which is B's public key, and verify the signature is valid because it was signed by B's private key. Uh, let's say uh, C, we're trying to do the spoofing here. Say we're generate the message uh, 1.2 has a MAC address say, then sign with its own private key. Then when A retrieve this uh, public, then uh, when A got this message, A will first retrieve the public key of 1.2 from the third party, the trusted third party. Uh, then you will use that public key to verify this message. And obviously it will not pass because this message is signed by C, not signed by uh, B. And we are using B's public key to verify that. So this will not pass. So this is a very simple idea, uh, but you can say um, it's probably quite expensive uh, because there are many messages at that uh, the data link layer. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what is the standard right now uh, at the ARP layer to secure those messages. Um, uh, but no, no matter what standard they have, the idea will be similar. We just want to add authentications to those messages. Uh, either use public key crypto or uh, symmetric key crypto. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, all I have for today. So that's uh, data link layer. Uh, next class, we move to the network link. Uh, any questions? So this this is only for local because this is data link layer. Uh, in this case. Uh, you have to introduce a trusted party, and that trusted party also needs to be in your local network. Yeah, so if you really want to make this happen, this can be part of your, um, like, let's say, your router. 
your router governs your local network. The router can run a services like this, right? It's possible, yeah. Well, the, the, the problem is not we are not keeping that mapping, is that the integrity of that mapping, right? Yes. The same thing, where, where does the switch learn that? The switch learn, learn that from other devices. And that message, the, the, whatever the switch has could be uh, incorrect in the first place, right? It's the same problem here, yeah. That's the same thing what he's talking about, right? If you do not bring crypto here, the, then you cannot maintain the integrity of that. You cannot maintain the the correctness of that. Someone can spoof that. Someone can say, I have this IP address and the, there is no way you can prove uh, if that's true or not. That's why we bring crypto here. Other questions?